Thank you for joining the Plant-Based Ecosystem Entrepreneurship and Impact event. I'm Kelsey Steele. I'm a recent graduate from Presidio Graduate School. And in case you don't know, Presidio is an MBA and MPA program, which focuses on the intersection of business and environmental and social justice. We're here because we think plant-based food advocacy is important, especially in the midst of a pandemic where plant-rich diets create a vision and opportunity to help the environment, human health, social justice, and animals. At Presidio, we're very excited because we just launched a default veg initiative in, when it, when, in which Presidio offers primarily plant-based options as their main choice during all events and gatherings. Um, and we're excited to continue this program, but since this has been put on hold because of COVID and shelter in place, we thought this was a great opportunity to talk about plant-based diets in a virtual space with these great speakers tonight. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to India. Hi everyone, I'm India Rose Matharu Daly. I apologize if you can hear pinging, that's just people being admitted onto the call. Um, so, the current pandemic has brought the dangerous consequences of our exploitation and destruction of the natural world into the spotlight. We know that the majority of new infectious diseases that have emerged in the 20th century are zoonotic, which means that they are transmitted to humans from animals. The Spanish flu, SARS, Zika, Ebola, AIDS, and COVID are all zoonotic diseases, and the list goes on. Animal agriculture, meanwhile, undermines our ability to protect ourselves from such illnesses. A staggering 73% of the world's antibiotics are used annually to raise hundreds of billions of land animals and farmed fish each year. Antibiotic resistance in food animals has nearly tripled in the last 20 years. Much ink has been spilled on our need to reimagine how the world works, to build a new equitable economy, to prevent climate change, and to prevent and protect biodiversity. The plant-based ecosystem, as we shall see, is already a solution to some of the world's most formidable challenges. We are delighted that a fantastic panel of plant-based luminaries are joining us today. Jean Bauer, co-founder and president of Farm Sanctuary, Chef Chu, founder and CEO of The Veg Hub, Tony Okamoto, founder of Plant-Based on a Budget, Kai Naughty, founder and CEO of Cubay Nice Cream, Feng Ru Lin, founder and CEO of Turtle Tree Labs, Christian Cadeo, Managing Partner Asia of Big Idea Ventures, Nate Solpeter, Consultant and Investor and Co-Founder of Sweet Farm. Each speaker will present for 10 minutes. There will be a Q&A after the first three speakers and final four speakers. Some of our speakers may have to leave as they're joining from all over the world, so our apologies for that. Please feel free to type any questions you would like to ask in the Zoom chat. And with that, I'll hand over to Nate for his opening remarks. Thank you so much, India and Kelsey, for uh, um, putting together such an incredible event uh, with uh, Presidio Graduate School and Sweet Farm. So Sweet Farm was founded five years ago, just over five years ago, uh, with the mission of creating a compassionate and sustainable world. And uh, through three key pillars of education, inspiration, and innovation, Sweet Farm has been uh, pushing the ball forward uh, to really drive this global impact. Now, today, we're super excited to have an incredible group of speakers that are champions in each of these individual uh, spaces, ranging from uh, plant-based proteins, uh, you know, uh, influencers and, and people who are really making uh, new trends, all the way out to very forward-looking uh, technologies in the case of uh, Fungru Lin and Turtle Tree Labs, uh, as well as some of the original uh, pioneers of, of the uh, farm animal welfare movement uh, with Gene Bauer. Um, so really excited about uh, today's speakers 
and we thank you all for for joining us um, today. You know, today uh, we're the U.S. is surpassing uh, these uh, uh, pretty, you know, very uh, tragic milestones with everything going on with uh, COVID, uh, and to you know, uh, you know, just emphasize. Uh, the importance of these things that we're discussing, um, you know, that India brought up uh, to really push uh, push the world into a much better place. Um, we're really excited to hear these uh, pioneers speak today. So uh, with that, I want to turn the uh, floor over to Jean Bauer, a co-founder of Farm Sanctuary and Pioneer and a great friend of uh, myself and Anna Sweet, uh, my co-founder of Sweet Farm. And uh, with that, uh, Gene, please uh, take the floor. Great, well, thanks, Nate. It's great to see you and thank you for your work on this and also India and Kelsey, thanks for your work on putting this together. It's wonderful to be with everybody here. Uh, we share the same vision in many ways of creating a kinder world and we all play different roles in that endeavor. And, you know, I started, uh, I became vegan in 1985 co-founded Farm Sanctuary in 1986. And at the time, the way that we funded the organization was by selling vegan hot dogs out of our Volkswagen van at Grateful Dead shows. And so at the time, we were a very small mom and pop organization. We have now grown. We have sanctuaries in New York and California. There are now hundreds of sanctuaries around the world. And it's wonderful to see the growing awareness and interest in these issues. Uh, but what I'm also increasingly recognizing is that in addition to rescuing animals from cruelty and caring for them at sanctuaries, it's critically important for us to start changing the food system. Uh, animal abuse uh, and the abuses of factory farming more generally are structural systemic problems. And, you know, there's no sanctuary that can rescue the billions of animals, literally, who deserve to be rescued. You know, at our sanctuaries, we currently care for about a thousand animals. And if you added up all the sanctuaries, um, you know, it still wouldn't be anything close to the number of animals who need to be rescued. Even if we rescued a million animals a year, it would be a drop in the bucket compared to the billions who are raised and slaughtered. So again, we need to get upstream from this. We need to prevent the problem uh, further up in the production chain. And so again, this is going to be systemic. And, and this is where I am so excited about the work that is happening at Sweet Farm, for example, where they're actually growing food. And I'm also very optimistic about opportunities to work with broader communities outside of just the animal rights vegan movement, uh, especially the animal rights vegan mo movement that I have known for 30 plus years now. And, and frankly, it's been a, a fairly white movement. It's been a fairly um, segregated movement in terms of not being connected with broader communities. And in recent years, I, I've, I've learned a lot about the history of awareness of plant-based vegan living and justice in the black community, for example. You know, Dick Gregory was a vegan back in the 60s and talking about the benefits of eating plants instead of animals and talking about uh, eating vegan as a social justice issue. Uh, Cesar Chavez, one of the founders of the United Farm Workers, was also a vegan. So if you, so, and I've recently just started learning more about these things and it's through working with people like Tracy McWhorter of uh, By Any Greens Necessary, um, we put together a, a guide together. She actually put it together. We, we supported it uh, to reach African American. It's an African American vegan starter guide. So, as we look to addressing issues of oppression, um, farm animals are, of course, some of the most abused creatures on the planet. We exploit them by the billions. But there are many other forms of cruelty and oppression that are connected to our food industry. And today with COVID, with slaughterhouses, with slaughterhouse workers, many who are people of color um, being forced to go in and being exposed to dangerous working conditions, that is a problem. And that is connected to our food system. Uh, at the same time, access to healthy food is also not 
equally dispersed. You know, people who live in certain communities um, have, in many cases, less access to healthy food, and as a result, are more likely to face health problems. So we are at a time now, I believe, where um, the vegan movement and animal rights folks uh, connecting more with and understanding more about aligned interests, aligned communities, working for justice, working for health, working for a better world, uh, have an enormous potential to, to find ways to work together. And so I'm very optimistic about some of what I've seen happening in urban agriculture, uh, where there's people growing food in community lots in inner cities in some cases. There's rooftop gardens. There's a food not lawns movement. Uh, you know, instead of just mowing lawns and putting down fertilizer, people can actually grow vegetables. And, and there's also, I think, opportunities for people to work in this area, for there to be meaningful jobs in agriculture, in a community-centered, plant-based food system. And so I've been talking, you know, largely about factory farming, animal agriculture, slaughterhouse workers, and how badly they are treated, and how certain communities may not have access to healthy plant foods. But I also want to mention that even in the case of produce workers, you know, people picking lettuce in Arizona, for example, there is a significant degree of exploitation. So even as a vegan who is eating plants instead of animals, there are other aspects to industrial agriculture, whether it is animal agriculture or plant-based agriculture, where there are forms of oppression, forms of exploitation. And my hope is that as these issues start being discussed all together among aligned organizers, activists, entrepreneurs, people who care, there will be increasing opportunities for there to be a coalescing of energies, coalescing of efforts, and effort towards stopping bad things in the food system, such as ending some of the worst forms of confinement, uh, making it so that workers don't have to endure the, the worst conditions in slaughterhouses. So we need to stop bad things, but we also need to start creating good things like community supported agriculture programs or like community gardens or food not lawns like I mentioned earlier, urban gardens, uh, farmers markets, uh, these more localized community centered plant-based food systems, which are healthier, which are more resilient, which I think will provide opportunities and jobs in, in entrepreneur spaces. And um, so that we can live well and, and live in a way that is not causing unnecessary harm to other animals, to other people, to the earth or to ourselves. So for me, a big part of this now is looking at systems and trying to challenge systems of exploitation and systems of extraction and in place of those try to support and build and create systems of mutuality you know so when it comes to the food in industry for example and factory farming that is sort of the epitome of extraction and exploitation where animals are seen as commodities where workers are also exploited where citizens are eating food that is making us sick and it's a system that is bad for everybody. And, and, and I believe that most people are humane and would rather not support cruelty. I think most people would rather eat food that is nourishing and doesn't make them sick. And I think most people would rather support a food system that doesn't destroy the planet the way factory farming does. You know, it, it takes, in the US, 10 times more land is used for animal agriculture versus plant-based agriculture. It's much more efficient to grow plants and eat those directly instead of to grow plants and feed those to farm animals. So eating plants instead of animals is efficient, would lighten our ecological footprint, uh, and then we could live on the earth without causing enormous harm the way we are through industrialized animal agriculture. So anyway, it's an exciting time that we have enormous opportunities. I think the animal rights vegan world uh, is starting to recognize that we have colleagues and allies uh, beyond what has traditionally been the, 
the U.S. animal rights movement. And I'm just very excited about the good things ahead. I'm excited about all the people that are on this Zoom call. And it's just wonderful to be here with you and uh, looking forward to staying in touch over the days, weeks, months, years, and creating a kinder, more compassionate world. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, and with that, we're gonna hand it over to Chef Chu, the founder of and CEO of VegHub. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's definitely a pleasure to be on this call. Um, I'm actually the founder, as, as was stated, of a nonprofit uh, vegan plant-based restaurant in Oakland. I'm also uh, the CEO of a plant-based uh, manufacturing uh, meat company that's also in Oakland. I'm gonna share my screen um, and tell you a little about my story um, about what I'm doing in, uh, in Oakland um, and about food deserts and intersection of plant-based foods. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everybody see the screen? Awesome, awesome. Well, um, let me start here. So again, I'm the founder of Something Better Foods. And again, we manufacture uh, plant-based proteins. And it's kind of interesting. I start my story about my personal story. I was actually uh, the son of a sharecropper. You can see my dad's arm. Um, you can't really see him, which I had a picture of, my, of him. But I'm actually, this is me. I'm about probably, I don't know, maybe a year old, two years old, probably a year old, I guess, at this point. This is Thanksgiving dinner. And the reality, at this Thanksgiving dinner, there was obviously a turkey. Um, there was obviously uh, probably fried chicken, some ham, um, who knows how many other meats was on the table, you know, mac and cheese, uh, greens, um, that was probably had some type of meat inside the greens. Um, but my family, we grew up a heavy meat eaters, um, excessive meat eaters, honestly. Um, and again, my go back to my father's story, uh, he was a sharecropper, which in which he actually grew up in the rural south and in, in southern part of Maryland. Uh, and again, he worked on a farm um for you know for pittance of wages um but the lifestyle and the diet was pretty uh was pretty pretty not that we not was not that great and this excessive meat consumption in my family um i literally was one generation for eating possum so i literally ate squirrel you know so you can imagine just that type of lifestyle and this excessive meat consumption had a very detrimental impact on my family's health we had everything from heart heart disease diabetes uh cancers and many of my family members died uh, before the age of 50 and many of them started literally getting lifestyle diseases at a very young age amazingly though uh, when i was in my teens uh, I, I actually stopped eating pork when i became 17 18 years old i became a vegan and this was 2001 so you can imagine uh veganism in 2001 as mr gene shared he started in 1985 i can't even imagine veganism in 1985 but in 2001 it's actually going by itself um, in 2001, literally plant-based foods tasted like dog food to me. I mean, it was horrible. After eating fried chicken and ribs and pork chops and ham, your first piece of plant-based food wasn't that exciting. Um, so I began a 15-year journey to understand, like I say, this, this amazing secrets of why I love meat so much. And I discovered that eating meat, what for me, was this experience of texture, taste, and appearance. And I literally started this journey in creating you know, my own plant-based fried chicken. I said, it looks like chicken, tastes like chicken, but guess what? It ain't chicken. It's crispy on the outside and it's white in the middle. Oh, it's delicious. And I started this journey in creating uh, this proprietary process made with 100% whole foods, grains, beans, uh, just natural ingredients to make something that my family will enjoy, to help people that look like me to transition into a lifestyle that I knew would be better and also would help to prevent the premature death that I saw so so vividly um, in my community. E even to the point where I lost my dad, you know, about six years ago, you know, again, to four different cancers, lifestyle related, and again, and this was a devastating thing uh, for my experience. As you look at statistics, as, as being said, again, when you think about the plant-based uh, movement right now, when you look at communities of color, uh, we have the highest rates of disease, diabetes, uh, cancer, heart disease, as one stat here says, risk of diabetes is 77% higher in African-American communities. As you look at COVID, you know, we're obviously black and brown communities have the highest rates of, of death uh, within these communities, uh, as far as from the COVID-19 crisis, um, the highest uh, risk of morbidity, as far as, again, cancers and so forth that lead to um, the, the death with, with the COVID crisis that we're going to. When you also go deeper, you'll see in these maps, these colored maps, where you see the, the high intensity colors of the, of the purple here and the green, these same maps also overlay food deserts. When you look at food deserts in this country, you also will see a, a, a correlation between food deserts, which is an area or a, a, you know, a community that typically doesn't have any grocery stores, 
Um, they have very high rates of liquor stores, convenience stores, fast food restaurants, and there's not a lot of access to healthy food options. Um, and so these same communities also, again, have the high issues of di uh, diabetes and obesity and heart disease. And the sad reality, when you go back and really kind of feel the onion, um, this actually, uh, the food desert crisis actually was, was based on race, racism in politics. Uh, there was something called the National Housing Act in 1934 that created redlining, um, where they pretty much uh, kind of pushed Blacks um, into the poorest areas of communities, where they had flood zones, uh, high industrial industrialization areas. Um, and those places was not able to be, like many businesses like grocery stores, couldn't get insurance. Uh, to be able to actually start stores, or other businesses in those areas. And so those historically and systemically became places where grocery stores and other businesses could not actually start. Um, in turn, we find that these places today in 2020, you have places in America where they don't have grocery stores, they don't have uh, healthy food options. In turn, you have high rates of di diabetes, you have high rates of heart disease. And again, I believe that a change has to come. What's exciting right now, I guess even before I go there, before I even go to this, this other point, you know, in the black community, we consume more fish. If you see here on the map, uh, we, um, on the stat, you'll see we consume more fish uh, and turkey, uh, chicken, and even pork. And, uh, and brown communities consume more beef. And so again, when you start thinking about plant-based and veganism and, 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 and even the environment, as, as obviously, you know, industrialized farming is one of the biggest exploiters of our environment. Uh, you can't really change this paradigm or this, this, this crisis without really focusing on communities of color who are consuming the most amount of meat, who actually, again, don't typically have access to these options. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a, a very serious issue that has to be addressed. The good news I wanna say is this, when you look at the stats of people going plant-based, people going vegan, uh, African-Americans are actually leading the charge. Uh, we're actually the, the leading uh, the group that's actually consuming plant-based foods. Um, and that's super exciting. Um, I like to say that, you know, think about African-Americans, we came here, uh, to America as obviously as just like animals were being exploited. Uh, we became the commodity uh, of labor uh, to be able to produce the food for this country. And obviously I, I always say excessive capitalism um, at, its, at its core is going to exploit something. Um, and so when you think about it from that perspective, um, the commodity that had to be exploited was, was people and it happened to be my people. Um, that being said, we ended up eating the worst types of foods, you know, everything from the pig feet to the chitlins, you know, the hog malls and, you know, all these things that just are detestable when you think about when it comes from a standpoint of food. Um, but the, the great thing I always say about, you know, my community as Black Americans is that it took a lot of creativity to make, a, to make chitlins taste good. I'm not sure if you guys ever smelled a piece of chitlin, but it still smells horrible. So for you to be able to make chitlins taste good, I always like to say, if you can make chitlins taste good, you better believe you can make some greens taste good. <laughs> so, you know, so the, the thing is, is that there was creativity that what I like to say that was there, where they took the worst of circumstances and made it into something beautiful. And it's amazing right now when you look at the issues uh, or the, 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 the change in our, in our society, when you see, again, people going plant-based, I think it was 600% increase in the last couple of years. And again, Black Americans, African Americans are becoming a very a mainstay culture. You know, you have rappers and musicians uh, turning, you know, going vegan and wanting to lead the charge of this. And so it's an exciting time. Um, lastly, you know, I actually started a nonprofit, I was the founder of a nonprofit vegan restaurant in Oakland. Um, this is one of the places where it's really became um, a place to really live out these values. Um, we're literally in a, a food desert community in Oakland. It's called the Veg Hub. Uh, and actually, we, we went there about 2016, and we uh, started an affordable, healthy, plant-based uh, restaurant. Uh, Pre-COVID, we did cooking classes and education. One of the things we realized is that one of the greatest uh, ways to bring about change, whether black or white or, or any color, uh, is education. You know, food is very cultural. And so when you think about getting people to change their lifestyle and change their eating habits, it's a cultural change. And without educating, it's hard for people to want to transition to something better or something different. And so we use our restaurant as a means of education. We do cooking classes. Um, we provide healthy food. And we just create an environment of love and help people to realize that, you know, why, why, if, you have, if you can taste, you know, a piece of chicken that looks like chicken, but it ain't chicken, hey, why not try that rather than eating something that's actually causing exploitation and so forth. And so, again, um, it's been an amazing journey for me. I, I'll leave, leave with this statement that, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a high time for us to be able to uh, make a change. And I believe that in 
in black communities and in, in, in brown communities that there's an opportunity, a massive opportunity uh, to help communities like this have better options. And it's gonna take a, a village, it's gonna take uh, talks like this and great people like you to help make that change. So I'm excited to be a part of this conversation and uh, help make change in our, in, our, in our communities. And again, my name is Chef Chu. I like to always say, as I always say, gonna give you something to chew on. Thank you, Chef Chu. That was great. Also, for anyone who just joined the call, please do um, put questions in the comments. Um, India, after three, after one more speaker, we're going to have a QA. and a And that, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tony Akamato, who is the founder and cookbook author of Plant Based on a Budget. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm just so honored to be amongst such fantastic people doing fantastic work. And I'm inspired already. Thank you, Chef Shu, for all of that goodness. Uh, and Gene, of course, but I think he's off the call. Uh, so my, my journey into entrepreneurship and plant-based living is very similar to Chef Chu's. Uh, I grew up in a family that was heavy on meat eating and Food for us is very cultural. I am culturally Mexican, although my Japanese last name kind of throws you off. Uh, and for us, it is a sign of affection. And when you don't want to eat someone's food, it can be disrespectful. And so uh, the journey has been long and I'm still growing and going through it. When I was a high school student, I was eating processed foods like nobody's business. And there was a Taco Bell directly across the street from my high school and I was a track runner. And I had never made the connection that what I put into my body was going to affect how I would feel. So I would eat Taco Bell and go run track and feel terrible afterward. And my coach said, hey, have you thought about not eating Taco Bell? And I was like, no. And, uh, and it, it wasn't until he explained that eating that processed food was harming my performance uh, that I started to make connections. But as I was living with my family, it wasn't easy. So the, pro the progress was very slow for me. I first gave up red meat as a suggestion. And then I became a vegetarian right after I moved out of my family. And it was not easy for my family. Uh, something that I heard over and over and over again was, we can't afford your fancy diet. We can't afford your fancy food. And I was a nanny. I shared a room with two other people and definitely did not live a fancy lifestyle. And so as I watched my family suffer from all these terrible health diet related issues, I I just wanted to share with them what I was learning along the way. And I uh, had my aunt die from type two diabetes before, uh, before she passed away. She had multiple amputations. My grandfather died from complications in a triple bypass surgery. There was gout. There were so many other people suffering. My 40 year old uncle had a heart attack and it just really broke my heart to hear that they felt sentenced to poor health because of their finances. And so I started compiling my family's recipes on plant-based on a budget. And at the time it was just a recipe, a recipe website. And after that, I got really involved in activism and it was my way of giving back to not only my family, but to giving back to my community who just, desperately wanted the information, but didn't know where to start. I, I often hear that, you know, people, um, they eat at fast food because it, they, don't, they don't care. And that is absolutely not true. The education, the lack of education uh, for nutrition information is just so poor in, in lower income communities, communities of color, and, uh, and so I, as I heard more information about what people were experiencing, I developed more resources for them. I 
compiled um, all the information that I could. I talked to people who were experiencing severe hardships, were very financially stressed, and especially looked at what was given for government assistance in food, so SNAP benefits, and tailored um, a plant-based meal plan where I showed people how to eat for $25 a week, and uh, it was a whole foods plant-based. So from there, I, I just decided I wanted to live in service. All I wanted to do was help people live. Prior to becoming a full-time plant-based entrepreneur with Plant Based on a Budget, I was living, I was working. Can, can you hear me? I'm sorry. It keeps saying the internet is unstable. So I, am I? We can hear you now. You cut out for a minute. Okay. I'm sorry. People are frozen. Am I good? Am I good? Yeah, Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I, oh, I was working at nonprofits and I really thought the only path for me to live in service was doing nonprofit work. And I loved it. I worked first for a farmed animal rescue and then I worked for vegan advocacy organization and I had not gone to college. Uh, and I went back to college in my late twenties, studied management at university of San Francisco graduated when I was 30 and started doing plant-based on a budget full-time as an entrepreneur. And when I told my dad that I was going to be a full-time blogger, he laughed at me. He thought, that's not a job. And I, I have since proven him uh, wrong. I have a team of six people that we know develop all sorts of really help people eat plant-based whatever their situation. I am a virtual friend. I've started, um, I've started, sorry, are you there still? You're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I've started uh, support groups online, virtual partnerships, uh, and have made a living uh, doing brand ambassadorships and selling um, things like the Plant Based on a Budget cookbook where I show people how to easily without breaking the bank. And furthermore, I own an online platform that is reaching millions of people. And, uh, and now I'm able to be on television as well, talking about how plant-based on a budget, how eating plant-based on a budget can be accessible and how you don't have to shop at specialty stores or um, live in a certain neighborhood and you can look like me and maintain a healthy vegan diet forever. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm really grateful to be sharing this story with you and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions uh, during the Q&A. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tony. That was super inspiring. Um, so India now is going to talk um, field questions that the audience um, wrote in the chat to Tony and Chef Chu. Yes, thank you guys so much for sharing. I will begin with um, some more general questions for both of you. How do you educate communities? Um, for instance, one of our audience members asked that the food pyramid is a fallacy. How do we change people's mindsets? Uh, well, I'll start. Um, you know, one thing I found, um, obviously there's a lot of miseducation when it comes to, uh, you know, food pyramids and just where you get your protein from. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I found is that when people taste a dish that you make for them um, and it tastes amazing, um, that's actually 100% plant-based. That's probably one of the most convincing things you can ever do. Um, I, I had an experience. I literally uh, went back home this last past week. I'm sorry, three weeks ago to my hometown. We did a we did a pop-up, like vegan pop-up um, for my community. And we brought back, you know, I brought my vegan meats that I make and vegan mac and cheese and greens. 
Um, and again, they, I had a couple hundred people that I grew up with taste the food um, and they loved it. And I, I think the, one of the biggest things I find is that when people taste something that tastes amazing, that's all plant-based, it's probably one of the most powerful ways to convince them to want to make change. Um, so that's what I would say, you know, as, an, as a quick answer. And I would say that uh, what has really worked for me is showing kindness and compassion and to meeting people where they are. Not everyone like myself is going to make an overnight transition. It took me years and it took me a lot of um, falling down and getting back up to continue on this journey when I was doing it solo. I didn't have a lot of support. My family wasn't there. And so to be kind and compassionate to where people are, to where people are starting on their journeys and to uh, create resources, offer them strong resources that help them overcome obstacles. Uh, that is, that, that has been the most effective. Thank you. Uh, for Chef Chu, have you had to reframe veganism and vegetarianism with folks local to Oakland as something that's not just what white people do? Um, how have you helped to ground veganism for them? For instance, did you recreate traditional dishes with vegan replacements? I know you've touched on that a little. Well, I think, you know, I think what I would say, I think that uh, at least in my experience in Oakland, um, you'd be surprised that I think like as the statistics are showing, the one of the leading groups that's going plant-based is African-Americans. Um, I don't even think there's a reframing. Um, I think that there's just a simple, uh, they're just, they're doing it. Um, it's, it's just becoming a part of their lifestyle. Um, I do think that obviously, you know, certain, sometimes the access, let's say in certain stores might not cater that, that typically aren't in black communities might not be there. But right now there's a phenomenon, there's a shift that's happening uh, within black America. I, I can't, I, you know, I can't speak as, I don't, I'm not, I don't know how I was going in the, in, in the brown communities. Maybe Tony can speak on that. Um, but I do know in Black America, there's people that are getting super excited. A lot of that's being influenced from people like, you know, uh, this different rappers that's going vegan, athletes is going vegan. Um, and so, honestly, most of my customers are African American. Um, and so I think there's, there's a definitely an excitement around eating healthy. Um, and so it's not been much of a reframing. It's just a matter of just providing great food. Um, there's a new restaurant that's in Oakland called The Vegan Mob. And um, you'd be surprised, <laughs> I mean, how long their lines can be. And he actually put hip hop um, into the vegan movement. Um, and so he just kind of just switched the concept. And I mean, Oakland is going crazy right now for plant-based food. And that's just, it's, it's really all races, but there's definitely a big surge, resurgence in the, in the a, surge, a surge in the black community, especially right now. Yeah. Uh, Who are some of you? Oh, go ahead, Tony, sorry. I, I was just going to, he, he said maybe I can speak uh, to the Brown community. I'll, I'll talk only about what I know, which is uh, what's happening in the Mexican and Mexican American communities. And that is, there is a movement to decolonize your diet. There have mm -hmm. been people working on this for quite some time, uh, at going back to the foods that indigenous peoples were eating. And that is more whole food plant-based uh, and less processed. And not a lot of meat. Yep. Yeah, someone asked a question. She says, how do you feel about traditional recipes that use meat? I am from Mexico and it is important for my family to pass down recipes. How do I go about replacing parts with plant-based products without insulting my family? That's a great question. Something that I have found uh, is there are so many great people who are discussing this um, at length. And some of those people, there's uh, Todo Verde, who is um, out of LA, and she just came out with a book, book, cookbook by the same name. And then there's Eddie Garza, I highly recommend him. Uh, he, has, he has a cookbook as well. Uh, and for what I've done myself is, I rely on soy rizo a lot. Uh, my, my family for breakfast often has soy rizo con papas, which is potatoes and um, what used to be chorizo, but is now replaced with soy rizo. And also beans and rice 
make a very great replacement. And um, the Eves or Ives ground beef uh, seasoned just like the way you would season another beef tastes uh, just the same. And my family doesn't miss it at all. Perfect. Now here's uh, Kelsey, we might, do we have time for one more question? Yes, you have. Okay, perfect. Here's an interesting question. I was sitting next to two vegan nutritionists on a long flight once, says one of our audience members, and they were explaining the correlation between eating meat and anxiety disorders. Is this accurate? Have you heard anything along those lines or similar? Um, that's a little bit above my pay grade, but I can, I'll say this. Um, I will say that I've, I've, I've learned through life that I've been a vegan for 20 plus years. Um, there's a def definitely a correlation between your, 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 how you feel and what you eat. Um, you know, obviously the, the meat has, you know, it, it, it has an impact on our phys you know, physiological aspects of how we think. Um, this as much as, you know, you eat a lot of sugar or certain things, a lot of fat can actually obviously bring a certain type of mindset and so forth. So, I mean, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I definitely would say that there's definitely many studies that show the correlation between the food that we eat and how it impacts our mind. Um, that's, there's definitely many doctors that explain that correlation um, that you can look into for sure. You have two minutes, India. So okay, you okay, we'll ask some more. Um, someone says, um, I am interested in getting involved in these issues and these changes. I'm not sure where they're based, but he says his background is in writing and fundraising. How can he do more? Where does he start? Uh, well, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I would figure out what my passion was if I, if I were in that space. There are so many parts of veganism, we'll say, uh, where you can get involved. Are you involved? If you want, do you want to get more involved more in the animal issues? Do you want to get more of the environmental issues? Do you want to get more in the food accessibility? I would find that group of people and uh, get as much information as I could. I remember when I was starting based on a budget as a business, I was talking to everybody I could about business and about being on a budget and just having that information helped set me on a path armed with knowledge. Perfect. Then finally, if we have time for one more question, have either of you ever partnered with politicians to help fix access to fruits and vegetables? And do you know about anything happening in public schools to help students learn and enjoy growing their own food, understanding plant-based healthy options? Um, you know, I'm actually, I'm not, I haven't ever partnered person with politicians, but I am, I'm finding like in Oakland right now, where we work with the council, city council members um, on this bringing awareness and advocacy. Um, we was actually awarded by one of our city council members, a local hero, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, for our community in Oakland um, to be able to, you know, we did education and bringing plant-based foods to a food desert community. Um, there are organizations like, right, I'm just starting to work with the Plant-Based Foods, Plant-Based plant Foods Association. Um, and there's organizations that exist that actually are, are fighting for policy and advocacy as it relates to policy change. Um, so there's a number of uh, plant-based organizations, vegan organizations that are actually um, working on policy. Um, I believe, Nate, the Good Food Institute, I think is one also that's doing a lot of work in policy as well. Um, so there's definitely entities out there that are working and behind the scenes and doing amazing work as it relates to policy when it comes to veganism and plant-based foods. Thank you, Chef Chu and Tony and India for the Q&A. Um, next, we're going to hear from Kai Norti, who is the CEO and co-founder of Kube Nice Cream. Hi everyone, how's it going? Very excited to be here. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit and then I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll flip it back over to me. So um, I'm Kai Norte, CEO and co-founder of Kube Ice Cream. I'm from Oakland, California. And I wanna just tell you um, 
really quick, I've been on my food journey and it's so important for people to realize and not shame people on their food journey. So I'm vegan now, but I grew up with a huge, huge organic vegetable and fruit garden in Oakland, California, huge. Like my mom was an avid gardener. And so we would often have like these conversations about the mama seed, mama earth seed versus the GMO seed and composting, you know, as early as like six, seven years old. So I grew up with a whole bunch of plant-based foods, but I also grew up with meat, right? And I also grew up with just thinking that, oh, you need just a little bit of meat. But over time, I realized that that was destroying our health. That was also, you know, when we talk about the slaughter and the oppression of animals, I'm also connecting that to the slaughter and oppression of Black people and Brown people and historically oppressed people all over the world. So let's go back, rewind. Um, so Kube and ice cream, what is Kube? Like, and why is it called Kube? Kube actually means the coconut from the Chui language in Ghana. That's where I have my first coconut. My husband and my co-founder um, is from Ghana and Canada. And we are both lactose intolerant and we were just so frustrated with like all the alternative dairy ice creams out there. Um, and so this is how Kube got started. So Kube is a Black woman-led vegan ice cream manufacturer based in Oakland, California. And so we're making the best tasting, most authentic cold pressed coconut. So we actually have patent pending equipment to crack, shred, and cold press the cream from the coconut shred. So now I'm going to go into, um, I'm going to share my screen. One second here. Okay, so you guys, y'all can see all this. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so Kube. So what is Kube, right? So I just explained that Kube um, is cold pressed raw coconut cream, but it also is really liberation ice cream. And I like to call it liberation ice cream because we are liberating people, historically oppressed people. We're liberating ice cream enthusiasts, right? Ice cream enthusiasts are also lactose intolerant folks who are also aller the part of the allergen population, right? And so we're really liberating people, animals, and soil from synthetic chemicals and liberating them from systems abuse. I'm talking about systems abuse. So you have this joyful, nice cream, right? And you know, we're gonna go into why is it full fat? Like the fact that it's cold pressed, you're getting full fat. That's what makes it creamy. When people taste Kube, they're like, damn, this tastes like real ice cream. Like, are you sure there's no dairy in there? People are like, I can't even taste the coconut in here. Like, how did you get it out? And I'm telling them, it's because I don't add sodium metabisulfite. So you're going to learn about this toxic bleaching chemical that the entire industry uses. Okay, wait. For some reason, I'm not able to... Okay, here we go. <laughs> so this is a coconut cream, the cold-pressed coconut cream that we work with. And it's so fresh. So after we cold press it from our hydraulic juice press machine, so we, we, we have all those shreds and we're cold pressing that out and it's raw, it's fresh, it's creamy. We will be pasteurizing soon and it will still taste the same. And we use all plant-based ingredients and organic ingredients where we can. Um, and I'm gonna go into this problem. This is a big problem and I'm like so angry about it because like I said, when I found out I was lactose intolerant, I wanted to try all the alternatives to dairy ice cream, right? And all this coconut ice cream was icy, metallic. And I'm like, what? It's dead. It tastes dead. It doesn't taste alive. And it's because of this sodium metabisulfite. So all, it's a whole international standard by the manufacturers in Asia, in India, wherever coconut cream is produced. And um, what sodium metabisulfite is a toxic bleaching chemical preservative. Now, the FDA says it's okay to have this in our coconut cream when there's 10 parts per million. But if there's 30 parts per million, you must label it. Now, you can see it, right? You see it labeled on that coconut cream a can, okay? So what that does is that extends the shelf life up to five years, five years. But to whose detriment? Whose health detriment, right? My health detriment, your health detriment. Why? How? Because when that's in there, and scientists have already substantiated that sodium metabisulfite causes gastrointestinal and hormonal issues. 
okay, if you have cancer, you don't want to be eating coconut cream from the can. It's in all coconut. I don't care if it's in a Tetra pack. It's in all of it. And people are like, but Kai, I can't see it. It doesn't stay it on there. And I say, yeah, because there's 10 parts per million. You have to do your research. Like you have to go to the FDA site. I went to, um, I had to call a manufacturer in Thailand that makes organic coconut cream and it's still in there. This is a problem. And so our solution and the opportunity is to really create a regenerative process and to say, hey, look, we're gonna start with fresh, mature coconuts. We're gonna shred this ourselves. We're gonna cold press the cream out, right? And then we're gonna have all this good soil resource. We have all these coconut shells. We have, you know, the shreds. So we press the shreds and get that beautiful cream out and then we make our own because again, Kube stands for economic liberation models, right? That are restoring life. When we talk about regenerative, regenerative means to regrow, right? It's to restore our vitality, our vibrancy, our health. So it's about really self-determination and collective determination, right? For better health outcomes. And that's what Kube stands for. So we have all these byproducts and they go back into making regenerative soils. So we give our byproducts, because we want the cream. We're focusing on the best tasting, most authentic non-dairy coconut ice cream, right? And so we can give our, our byproducts to um, soil farms and urban communities. And that's what we do. Um, Planting Justice is in East Oakland. And this one was in West Oakland, but we give most of our byproducts right now to East Oakland Planning Justice. They hire formerly incarcerated folks and teach them permaculture skills and they have high wages, they have health insurance. So again, regener regenerative is looking at how do we rebuild our relationships with people, with companies and with the ecosystem, right? The ecosystem of manufacturers, of farmers, of urban farmers, of stores. What stores are really, um, you know, supporting this ecosystem, right? So it's it's a, it's looking at all these facets. Um, probably have to hurry up. So we're really building this full circle economy, right? And so right now we're getting our coconuts from Mexico, and we're identifying farmers to pay directly. So I have that going right now. Um, and then so it's it's getting coconuts from black and brown coconut farmers. And I really want to emphasize that black and brown coconut farmers also need access to the international market of coconuts. Why? Because most big companies like, um, well, I won't say, <laughs> most other companies that are dealing with coconuts and ice cream, coconut ice cream are getting their coconuts from Thailand, Indonesia, where the government really puts in a lot of money into those farms. But when you're looking at black and brown farmers from the Caribbean, they're dealing with a lot of other issues of racism and uh, economic oppression. And so it's really important that we support black and brown coconut farmers in Mexico and then also in the Caribbean and Jamaica. Um, so again, we cold press the cream. We have, we're left with these shreds, as you see in the compost bag. And we take our compost and create regenerative soil so that people have really good nutrient dense soil. And folks at um, Planting Justice have told me that you know the, the the worms really love this carbon of the 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 shreds that and they decompose it and it makes really good soil to grow food so here's uh you know the proliferation of all these urban gardens everywhere it's beautiful okay and so you see folks here this is what it's about kube is about building the eth an ethnically inclusive food justice and health economy right we're talking about restoring that value to our life We're talking about moving away from systems of extraction right to systems that regenerate so we're talking about being able to grow our food having access to clean food having access to, to good information um, critical information that the schools don't want to teach there's a reason why nutrition is not inside of all the classrooms right so also, the other part of Kube is um, not just promoting the urban gardens and our compost, but it's also looking at who we want to intentionally hire as we're raising funding and we will be selling preferred stock in Kube next month in August. We want to hire formerly incarcerated folks, returning citizens. There's lots of people coming back home and folks need opportunities for personal and social transformation, right? Like it's a lot of people coming back home. It's a lot of people who've been wrongly incarcerated. All right, am I at 10 minutes? Oh, I can't hear you. 
Thank you. You're at 10 minutes. Okay, I'm done. Uh, let thank me, you uh, very much. Let me stop Bye. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> actually done. <laughs> okay. Perfect. And to anyone who j just hopped on, if you have any questions, please make sure to um, put them in the comments as we'll be, uh, India will be asking them during the Q&A. So next we're going to pass it up, up to Fungru Lin, the co-founder and CEO of Turtle Tree Labs. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. Um, as Kelsey said, um, I am the CEO of Turtle Tree Labs. And uh, today I would like to share why, why it's so important to work with industry as a startup to replace the source of milk for infant nutrition and dairy products. So here at Turtle Tree, we are the first biotech company in the world to use cell-based technology to create real milk. The tech is really transformative. The platform is able to produce milk from all kinds of mammals. It's really interesting. And that includes goats, sheep, camels, and cows, and even humans. So all these animals, with the exception of humans, don't really have a choice and are forced to be impregnated continuously for their milk. Although we can, we can produce mammalian milk, why is our initial focus on human milk? Do you know that infant formula today uses mainly cow milk powder? It is the fastest growing segment of dairy, currently at $45 billion worldwide and expected to grow to $106 billion in the next five years. We knew right away that using our technology, we could make infant formula infinitely better and remove the use of cow milk. Milk is really 90% water. So just imagine how much milk they use to create milk powder just for the infant nutrition industry. This is a huge opportunity for us to work with existing infant formula companies and provide them with access to our technology. Working with industry, we want to tap on their extensive know-how on market access and local regulatory resources because they have extensive large consumer insights teams that can help us to understand local preferences. Infant nutrition, um, for example, in India is actually sweeter than that in Singapore. So this local nuances, we want to be able to work with industry to understand. So dairy, um, having early revenue also means that we can focus on R&D to continue cutting costs for production of cow milk. Dairy milk from cows is really a cutthroat industry. It's a commodity with razor thin margins and requires massive scale. It is a $700 billion industry that currently is propped up by millions of cows globally and Turtle Tree's biggest opportunity for impact. This is where working with industry ex is extremely crucial for scaling. Once we get the price point low enough, it wouldn't make sense for them to continue exploiting the animals. They can easily license our technology and bioreactors, thereby replacing the factory farms. Not just that, but the entire industry can really benefit tremendously from the consistency of our milk and not have to worry about contaminants in groundwater like PFAS. For those of you who don't know what PFAS is, it's the synthetic chemical that is used in Teflon production and it has been linked to cancer and many health issues. So Teflon is found in non-stick pans, is found in fire retardants, and um, it's, been, it's been showing up in our milk. So let's take a step back and ask, isn't there already alternatives like oat and almond milk? Personally, I love oat milk and um, these, these things are really delicious. But the fact is, globally plant-based dairy products have about 1% market penetration in the market. This means that we have to work together with cell-based technologies and other sources to transform the global dairy industry. Most of the dairy consumption out of the 700 billion is really on high value dairy products like cheese, butter, and cream. We all know that it's pretty challenging to produce these complex products using plant-based ingredients. And like what Jean said, People would rather not consume food from inhumane sources, but people's habit is really difficult to change. So the major cheese, butter, yogurt companies will continue making these products because it's revenue generating for them. So the best way for us to make change 
the best way for us to encourage less animal ingredients is to provide access to alternative sources of milk, but really with the same composition and the same functionality. It's been reported that we will have 10 billion people coming onto this planet by 2050. We have a lot of mouths to feed. We need to collectively come up with solutions that are sustainable, accessible, and humane. I'm quite confident that by our lifetime, we get to a point that animal agriculture will be phased out. Using biotech and various solutions, we can save the planet and become a much more compassionate species. I'd like to share something with you, um, some ex interesting experiences. Prior to the COVID lockdown, I was pretty fortunate to have a tour around some of the large, massive facilities that provide dairy to the world. Each of these plants would cost upwards of $800 million, and each of, even just one of the dryers would cost about $200 million. And this is not a cost that startups or new businesses can bear. So I went back to my team and we're now working on ways, the best methods to partner up with the Danons, the Nestle's and Fonterra's of the world. So we can continue working with them to make a bigger impact. And really it's a two way conversation. They are super interested to talk to us as well because we can help alleviate some of the challenges that they are facing today. As highlighted by COVID, when logistics break down, milk is being dumped and cows cannot simply stop their milk production so they keep producing milk. And it really breaks my heart to see that they continue being exploited and especially so in vain. Some of the conversations that we've had with the dairy industry was very interesting. They were keen to find out what our go-to-market strategy was. Were we going to build our own brands? Were we going to look at joint ventures? Or are we simply licensing our technology? If we don't work with these industry partners, they not only may steal the technology, but might find, might find ways to elbow us out. Our technology has great potential and it's really our responsibility to work with everyone for maximum impact. One of the companies that um, as Total Tree we look up to is Arm Semiconductors. They're not in the food industry, they are IT and tech. They really are the largest chip company in the world that doesn't make a single chip. Their entire the entire tech industry, like the Samsung, the Apples, they use their chip architecture to design their computers and mobile phones. And ARM mainly works through a licensing and royalty model. This allows them to focus on what they're good at, which is in R&D, allowing them to be the R&D hub for the entire industry and saving billions of dollars for, in R&D for the entire tech industry. Similarly, Turtle Tree, we want to be the R&D hub of the dairy industry working with all the various partners like Dan and Nestle and Fonterra, providing cell-based dairy across the world and alleviating the pressure on cows for milk production. To round off, um, I'd like to quote Winston Churchill. In 1931, he shared that it would be absurd to grow the entire animal just to consume some of his parts. In the same vein, it is really absurd that we are raising whole cows just to take her milk. Turtle Tree can help to bypass the animal and allow the rest of the world that is supporting that $700 billion industry to continue accessing their favorite dairy products. And I'm quite thankful that here in Turtle Tree, we can be part of the solution and do our part to make this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Pankro. Um, and, and anyone, if you've joined, please do put your questions in the comments for the Q&A. And next, I would like to introduce Christian Cadio, managing partner of Big Ventures, Big Idea Ventures. Hey everyone, sorry about that. I think I was on participant mode and I couldn't unmute myself. So uh, first and foremost, I thank you for the opportunity here. And I'm actually quite excited. I'm excited because my role and our team's role is really looking to find the next great entrepreneurs. And I'm hoping to be able to convince you know, all the graduates from Presidium School to actually, if you have a great idea, to look to us as potentially for your first investment, or at least to help you on. So this is a good opportunity for me to 
sit here and kind of convince you why you should think about why you should think of actually potentially looking out and reaching out to big idea ventures. My camera keeps on turning off, so I apologize, but I am, but you don't need to see me. I'm gonna present a really short deck here, so give me a second. Okay. Can I just get a someone, one of the hosts, if you can please confirm if you can see it, because this is all full screen yeah. now. I right. can see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, so first and foremost, I wanted to go in and, and talk a little bit about what is Big Idea Ventures. And we simply are a venture capital fund that invests globally. So we have a physical office in New York, and we have a physical office in Singapore. We have, we're trying to raise about 50 million US dollars under, under management. And we focus really only on two sectors. The first sector is plant-based foods. And this could be anything from meat, seafood, eggs, dairy, protein, snacks, and then cell-based. You know, so cell-based, similar to what Fungu was mentioning, you know, companies like that that are doing cell-based meat. It could be beef, poultry, seafood, and so forth. And the third area we invest in is ecosystems or companies that are trying to basically scale up these respective two categories. Now, I'll give you an example of something like that. Think of picks and shovels that would help the cell base scale, right? So some of the challenges in cell base, for example, there are big enough bioreactors, which are just imagine these, these, uh, these vats that are growing the cells, right? So are there companies or startups that are looking to alleviate that challenge or be able to do food grade industrial bioreactors? So these are what ecosystems. So we, we really only invest in these two areas. So it's really specific. And it's our core expertise. And I think that's why we built a team that if we're fortunate where we're able to talk to you or your company, you would feel like, hey, there's a lot of value outside of just purely getting capital. So let me, my job here is really to convince you why you should even talk to us, right? So I want to kind of surface three points. Uh, the first one is the team's record, right? So this is our first fund of the team here. So Big Idea Ventures is our first fund. But the team itself has a pretty strong track record in terms of investment. We've had team members who invested in Beyond for the IPO, um, Memphis Meat, which I don't know if you heard, just raised about $180 million, uh, Impossible, and I worked at Just. So I think we're quite proud where probably one of the few VC funds that have team members who have literally been either investing or worked at the three biggest unicorns in the alternative protein sector. We probably just need to get someone from Oatly and then I think we'll have uh, all four, right? So team record. Number two is the team itself. And so we have 10 full-time people in Singapore and New York, and I'll lead off with our technical team. And I think this is something that sets us apart is really where when we talk to entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs, you know, the first question when it comes to food is, I may not do, I don't have that much food experience. Maybe I'm a culinary chef on the side or I'm a hobbyist and what's not. Can I still do a food tech startup? And the question, at least for us is 100%. In fact, this is where we think if you're a great entrepreneur, you got a great idea, you, got a, uh, you have a minimum viable product, just to be clear, we don't invest in people's just idea, but you have a minimum viable product that you maybe just created in your own kitchen, we'd love to help you. And besides give you capital, we literally have a full-time technical team, three research, three food, or two food scientists, one chemical scientist on staff that will sit there and actually literally help you while you're in the program. You know, so I'll give you one example is one of our portfolio companies in Singapore they wanted to change one of the formulation of the product. And the two uh, co-founders actually didn't come from a food background. Well, so we had Dr. Zhao here, worked with them for four months and literally changed the formulation with them. As part of our services, it doesn't cost any more. In fact, we're paying you to use our resources, right? So I think we're quite proud of that is having three full-time technical person on staff that can help you scale up your business while you're part of, uh, we do have this accelerator tranche. Then once, you know, outside of the technical sport, we have an amazing business team, right? And it's led in New York by Abby in, in New York, and then Dr. Jalal in the prior slide in Singapore, who are gonna help you scale up your business, whether it's co-packing, manufacturing, bringing the right mentors, uh, bringing the right ex expertise into while you're part of the accelerator. You know, our team is, I think probably, you know, we feel really proud that they have the expertise and the skill set to kind of help you scale on that as well. 
and then you got you got us you know you got myself uh you got the founders of the fund and our chief investment officer so i think you know i, I won't really uh, talk too much about that you can read my bio uh, on kind of linkedin and so forth but i think what we're really proud of is you know as i mentioned yeah 10 full-time members in singapore new york and 60 percent of our team is people of color uh 60 percent of our team are actually women and i think that's something where it's quite reflects not only on our culture, but number three, and most importantly, in who we invest in, right? So, and this is the third point I want to kind of convey is we've done, we started the fund, we did our first close in March of last year. So it's only been about a year and two months. And the thing is, I think the thing I'm really proud of is we've done 26 investments in the span of a year and a half. So we didn't just start a fund just to say we are starting a fund and not deploy any capital. We want to invest in you. And in fact, in the midst of the pandemic, in last in March, when everything was kind of falling apart globally, we invested in 13 globally around the world. You know, we had investment in China, Philippines, Singapore, Turkey, um, Australia, US, you name it, we've invested in it. So I think it's something where we actually take action and we actually make investments into phenomenal entrepreneurs. Number two, let me go back into kind of the team culture. You know, as mentioned, we're, we're quite proud of the diversity uh, that we were able to build into the actual team itself. And it shows in our investment. So I'll give you two points. The first, our first two investments we did globally was a company called Shop Me, was led by an, two amazing entrepreneurs, scientists, Dr. Sandy and Dr. Kylie. Our second investment out, uh, after Shop Me was a company called Confetti Food in Singapore led by a first time entrepreneur, Betty Lou. Both companies are led by phenomenal CEOs and we're really proud to be in them. They just happen to be women as well. The second thing was you know, we did our first round of investment in New York. Uh, our first cohort started in November. Of the eight companies, two were actually co-founded by African-Americans. One is Plant Kind, which is doing phenomenal in terms of making the best mayonnaise. I would say it's significantly better than just where I used to work. And the second company is basically Please Cheese. So Please Cheese is basically out of Baltimore and they are making this really kick-ass cheese that you put on pizza that it, it, just, it, just, it just rocks, right? So I think what we're, my point in saying this is uh, if you are looking for investment, if you're looking for someone who's deploying capital and someone that's actively investing, we'd love to talk to you. So let's just kind of talk about what do we offer, right? In terms of, actually investment. So the way the fund's set up is there's two tranches to the $50 million in capital that you'll have. The first tranche is what we call an accelerator. And it simply is this, is twice a year, what we'll do is we'll take applications in. So in fact, we're taking in our first cohort three in which will start in January in both Singapore and New York. And what we do is we basically offer you in cash, $125,000 in cash, and then a relevant services of in-kind services. For that amount of capital that we provide to you, we're looking at about 7%, roughly about 7% in terms of equity ownership via SAFE. And then we would expect for you to spend five months with us in either our Singapore or New York location. Now, we know you're entrepreneurs, you run your company, and we didn't invest to, make, to babysit you know, all of our startups and our founders. So I think it's something where we found out being virtual does work. And it's something where, you know, we are flexible in terms of location as well. You know, as I mentioned, in just the Singapore location of Cohort 2, which is running right now, there's roughly, you know, other companies. We got a company from Australia, from China, from Philippines, one from Belgium, and of course, one from Singapore. The one in New York, we got companies from the, the West Coast. We got a company from Turkey. We got a company from India. So in terms of a geographically where you are, doesn't matter to us. If you got a great minimum viable product, you have a great vision, we'd love to talk to you. So this is the first tranche, right? It's an accelerator. And again, I mentioned before, it's, it's a combination of giving you capital, but more importantly, the reason why we have 10 people on our team is we want to help you scale. You, know, you should be using us. We're working for you. You know, as I mentioned before, we had an example where Dr. Matthew literally worked with one of our full companies for a couple of weeks, I think it was on six weeks to help one of the products. One of our entrepreneurs in Australia, it's a husband and wife team, they're strapped in terms of time and they needed to get their social presence up. Well, you know what we did is we literally had two members of our staff Christine. take over. 
I'm gonna have to cut you off then, but thank you very much. Okay, no problem, thank um, you. And this is the last call for anyone. If you wanna uh, have questions submitted for the Q&A portion, please do put them in the, uh, the chat. And I'm uh, pleased to uh, present the last speaker, Nate Sa Sal Peter, co-founder and executive director of Sweet Farm. Excellent, thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, here, we'll uh, uh, try and uh, stop the sharing there. All right, fantastic. Well. Um, Thank you so much for for all of the participants, you know, who have who have presented, you know, their amazing companies and projects and uh, initiatives uh, already. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Sweet Farms work uh, here, so I'm going to share uh, my screen here as well, and um, so we'll see right here. Okay. All right. Can you all see my screen? Perfect. Okay, so uh, so Sweet Farm was founded five years ago uh, with the with the mission of creating a compassionate and sustainable world. Uh, but Sweet Farm really wanted to focus on uh, uh, being complementary to a lot of the incredible work that is being done around the world, uh, both from uh, individuals, organizations, whether it's nonprofit or for profit. Uh, scientists in research institutions, and and to really support them all, uh, you know, uh, most effectively, we realize that an ecosystem is really um, what's needed. Uh, but uh, oftentimes, what's what's missing in some of these these uh, uh, ecosystems or initiatives is an actual space to to kind of centralize uh, things around. So when Sweet Farm was was uh, initially created, it was created as an animal sanctuary, uh, but very quickly we moved into uh, the plant-based agriculture space as well. And and why did we do that? Well, we did that because uh, we, we knew that, you know, focusing on only one aspect of the food system and expecting broad change is kind of like uh, adjusting the timing belt on a car and expecting an entire new car to show up. So uh, instead, you really need to approach it from a systematic uh, uh, standpoint. So if you if you consider the different your two two faces of of the food system, you have your plant based agriculture uh, systems and you have your animal based agriculture systems, both of which have a lot of of broken aspects to want to themselves. And those broken systems also are propping one another up uh, to the detriment of uh, animals, uh, the land, and, and also the communities um, that, that are involved in those productions. So uh, when I'm talking about communities, it's it's everything from uh, the, the use of slave labor slave labor and supply chains in certain countries for uh, dairy production. It's uh, the use of uh, the use of all sorts of different uh, pesticides and herbicides that are known to be uh, carcinogens in tomato production in Florida, um, which have you know, massive uh, health implications for the communities that are growing uh, the food to feed the world. And, and part of the status part of, of this is uh, oftentimes those people that are producing uh, the food for the world to eat can't even necessarily uh, afford the food that they're picking. So very, very broken system. Uh, and it really, it really uh, necessitates a systems level thinking uh, when you're when you're approaching this um, that doesn't uh, isolate uh, any one of the problem. Of course, we, we have to focus we have, but we have to have a big, uh, a big vision to that. So uh, who am I? Uh, well, I'm a growth mindset individual, and I myself am pro uh, part of a broader sustainability ecosystem. So I'm an animal rights advocate, of course. Uh, my wife, Anna Sweet, and I co-founded Sweet Farm. Uh, I'm a nuclear engineer, uh, so I have a PhD in mechanical engineering, but I design nuclear systems. Uh, what I can say is that uh, designing a nuclear reactor, the complexity of a nuclear reactor is nothing compared to the complexity of the global food system. So uh, it doesn't even pale in comparison. I'm also a mushroom and healthy soil enthusiast. Uh, I'm a food and sustainability technologist. 
uh, but I'm also an investor and advisor for a variety of companies. So uh, She Oak Meats, uh, which uh, Christian uh, had mentioned, uh, myself and a good friend, Ryan Bethencourt, we actually wrote the very first uh, check into She Oak Meats to get them off the ground to, uh, uh, to launch. Um, it's really you know, about identifying uh, those, those cornerstone uh, opportunities that can really launch an entire sector uh, of, you know, of the technology space in the food or, or ag tech uh, space that, that I really uh, focus on. Now, Sweet Farm, as I already mentioned, uh, we're dedicated to creating a compassionate and sustainable world. We are doing it uh, by positioning ourselves at the nexus between education, inspiration, and innovation. So uh, why these three together? Well, uh, education, you need to educate people on what are the issues, why are they important, um, but you need to inspire those people to you know, take action and, and make their own personal change. Now that can be uh, whether it's a, a child or uh, you know, an adult and parent or a budding entrepreneur or maybe an investor or even a policymaker. You need to inspire them to, to own up uh, to their responsibility to the world, uh, to the communities they serve, um, you know, or to maybe you know, their own individual uh, health uh, through their choices. So you need to inspire those people to take that action. That said, uh, there's been a lot of work on these two pillars uh, alone over a matter of decades. Uh, but what's really exciting uh, you know, currently is that there's a lot of work in the innovation space. Uh, if you look over the past several decades, you have these uh, long periods of time where it was uh, uh, you know, legendary landmark products, you know, Tofurky and Soy Riza and like these, these main products that have you know, paved the way. Um, but now, just in the last couple of years, uh, the pace of innovation across uh, plant-based proteins, uh, you know, plant-based dairy alternatives, cellular agriculture, as Fen as Fungru uh, Lin uh, talked about, you know, is really pushing the envelope in terms of, um, you know, how can we, uh, you know, reduce the land use, uh, reduce the abuse, uh, eliminate the animal from the equation uh, to feed the world's uh, 9.7 billion people that are going to be on this planet. By uh, by 2050, um, and it's through through innovative products and technologies, and not just on the the protein and dairy side. This is also on the agriculture technology side. So, on the education front, uh, we actually uh, so on the uh, education front, when uh, when COVID started, we actually uh, prior to COVID, we were doing all of our our. Uh, education and inspiration activities here on the farm. That included whether it was entrepreneurs or investors, um, uh, as well as schools and, and whatnot. Uh, however, uh, as soon as we went into shelter in place, Sweet Farm launched our Goat to Meeting program. Uh, well, just since March of 25th, March 25th of this year through today, uh, we have completed over 6,100 virtual education field trips with individuals all over the world. So we've actually called into all seven continents, including the scientists uh, in the South Pole. Uh, we've tapped into over 250,000 individual attendees with one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, helped uh, 10 sanctuaries financially uh, through this program to, to weather the storm. And of course, it wouldn't be possible without uh, our partner. I have to do a shameless plug, but we absolutely love their support on our education programs with uh, GoToMeeting uh, by Log Me In. Uh, and to answer one of your questions you might have, is it effective, right? Can you actually get people to make a connection? And uh, this was just from today. Uh, someone actually uh, posted uh, posted a uh, tweet, uh, tweet and said, my husband got goat to meeting for his team to get today. I walked over to see the goats on his Zoom and he was crying over a goat rescue story. Uh, I know I married, I knew I married the right man. So uh, the point is clear, like you can share these uh, inspirational stories and the background of these animals and make a profound impact. Now with, uh, with our inspiration uh, avenues, of course, we're having to move into uh, some interesting uh, ways to sow seeds of inspiration uh, with uh, current and next generation uh, individuals as well. 
So here you see uh, people sowing seeds uh, literally on the farm, uh, but moving digitally, we're now doing things like uh, digital compost workshops and whatnot. So we're still pushing uh, the envelope on that front. Then on the innovation front, uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, I mentioned uh, Shiok Meats already, um, but I wanted to highlight some of the exciting uh, aspects that are out there with Oatly. They had just raised a $200 million round. Uh, Mark Post uh, is there with his uh, cell-based burger. Um, he, he actually uh, uh, just uh, announced, there was an announcement just in the last uh, couple of days about uh, how there's been an 80x reduction in the cost of their growth medium for their uh, cell-based uh, uh, product with his company, Mosa Meat. Uh, when he first made his first burger, it was over $300,000 for that one burger. Um, now it's down to around $50 per pound. So um, incredible progress on that. And then I put this uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken with the Beyond Fried Chicken in the phone because uh, uh, someone took that photo of a line uh, out the door when uh, KFC ran their very first trial. Thank um, Thank you, Nate. We're going to have to move on to the Q&A. Sorry to cut you off. Okay. All right. No problem. Thank you. Okay. We have lots of great questions. First of all, what are the panelists' thoughts on referring to plant-based products as meat replacements or meat alternatives? Would you like to see a shift in labeling and describing plant-based products differently? Yeah, so I can uh, I can take this uh, first question here. So with respect to labeling, there is some uh, there's been some uh, kind of landmark cases that uh, there's been some landmark cases about how um, some of the agriculture checkoff programs, uh, which is basically a tax on uh, effectively a tax on uh, farmers, uh, whether you're plant based farmers or or animal farmers, um, that uh, actually funnels uh, lobbyist groups uh, for for uh, uh, advertising. And in some cases, uh, there's a case uh, just a few years ago uh, about the egg industry actually going after uh, just uh, uh, Hampton Creek at the time about uh, about their egg products. And there there is already starting to be a shift and pushback from both farmers, even in, even in animal agriculture, uh, but also these new food technology companies around abuses uh, with these uh, programs uh, because they are uh, funneling money into lobbyists to uh, get, get labeling like a plant-based burger uh, to, to no longer be allowed instead of replacing that with something like uh, plant-based uh, you know, protein disc or something strange like that absolutely ridiculous. There's a lot of historical precedent around uh, the, the abundant use of certain terminology and, and that it should uh, be allowed to continue. You can look at this with like Dijon mustard, even though it's from Dijon, it's allowed to stay because it's been used for decades um, and actually beyond that. So uh, I think there's, um, uh, it's, it, it's a no brainer. I think a lot of the politicians are laughing it off um, but it's uh, very important that there's a lot of people pushing back on this from all different angles, both from the entrepreneurs and the consumers and the voters. So I'll jump in. So Nate brought up something pretty interesting. So I was literally, I was actually working at just quote, 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 Hampton Creek when we had that, it was called the Mayo Wars, right? With uh, basically Unilever who sued us for using the word mayonnaise. And I think one thing that Josh, who's this founder, founder and CEO of just did very well with he didn't back he didn't back down he actually went up and it was the right move because from a well first and foremost you know i think we were in the right in terms of the labeling uh, number two he was able to get kind of ground support from the community showcasing how how he was the david and unity was just goliath and trying to kind of arm a startup and stuff like that so i think this is going to continue uh, moving forward and it's going to be a bigger bigger more pronounced issue as as Nate rightly mentioned, a lot of these lobbyists, you know, they're, they're going to fight back pretty hard. I remember one of the lobbyists sent over, uh, we, we used a, uh, what is it? It's a fair, it's fair information act. And one of them had written, I think jokingly, but I don't think so as well. It was like, Hey, they wanted to assassinate Josh over this and stuff. It was just ridiculous stuff. Right? So. Thank you. 
Um, our next question is for Feng Ru. Do you think it would take a long time for the public to be educated and finally adopt turtle tree created milk? It's a great initiative. What are some of the applications that turtle tree technology can achieve outside of human and bovine milk? Let me address um, the first question first. Um, that was, sorry, what was that again? <laughs> Um, they asked, do you think it would take a long time for the public to be educated and adopt your milk? Sure, absolutely. It's, it's really a journey uh, that we, that everyone is taking. And um, lucky for us, we're not the first person, the first people to be doing it. Um, as you know, there's, there are companies like Memphis Meats, there are companies like Blue Nalu, who are really helping us to educate the market. Um, and prior to that, um, plant-based products, um, like having plant-based KFC, these are things that are helping us to allow people to be more aware of alternatives. And this journey is not something that we're doing alone as well. Um, especially here in Singapore, there is a lot of government support. Um, we are partnering with one of the universities here, plus the Singapore Food Agency, which is the FDA equivalent here in Singapore. We're partnering with these parties to, to build up a multi-year um, perception study um, to, to understand what the consumers think and what is the best methods to, to go to market with, um, with these insights. Um, on top of that, because milk is such a complex product, um, there are thousands of components inside milk. So we're really fortunate because we can highlight some of the high value components and go to market a lot faster. So some of the interest um, from this, da this dairy companies have been around the human milk oligosaccharides, which are the um, complex sugars found in human milk, as well as human fat. So human milk fat is used as fortifiers for infant nutrition. So this early wins um, can allow us to component by component um, help people to, to accept this technology more. And to your question, um, outside of bovine and human milk, what are the other applications? Well, something that we're working with um, that is really interesting is uh, we're working on creating milk for animals which are endangered. So the Smithsonian Institute has, has reached out and they've had challenges around um, snow leopards. Snow leopards in captivity, the mothers tend to attack their babies because they're stressed out. So they have to separate mother from cub. So they've come to us and asked us if we could provide snow leopard milk um, for, for these babies. And we said, hell yeah, um, we're, our scientists are really excited. We're going to work something out. And here in Asia, in Sumatra, elephants are also hunted for their tusk to make ivory. And elephant milk is one milk that is so nutrient dense that humans cannot consume and has been really difficult to replicate the nutritional profile of elephant milk. So Save Earth has, has reached out as well to ask if we could make elephant milk. So our team is uh, working on that too. That's amazing. So pleased to hear that. Something for everyone and all creatures. <laughs> Our next question's a fun one for Kai. Where can we get some Kube? I have a recipe that needs vanilla ice cream. Hi, yes, we just had a sale online and we sold like 80% of our inventory sold out in an hour and a half. People set alarms for Kube, y'all. Like it's really, really authentic, super creamy, bold flavors. When you taste it, you're like, oh my God, this is really the truth. So you can go to, uh, if you're in San Francisco, because we're selling locally just to folks in California right now in the Bay Area but you can go to um, Museum of Ice Cream in San Francisco. They have the storefront on One Grant Street and they are open, I wanna say Wednesday through Sunday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we do have our goddess empowerment there and we have the bittersweet chocolate with cacao nibs there. So check that out and you will notice a difference. People in America really have not experienced fresh, authentic coconut ice cream. And all the coconut ice cream here is imported. So again, what we're really do building is locally resilient food systems and non-dairy coconut ice cream manufacturing back here. So 
Um, there's a lot of great works. We also have patent pending equipment that's um, designed for robotic autom automation. Let me say that again, coconut robotic automation. That's something that I did not speak on, but all over the world, there really isn't any high tech coconut equipment um, to increase safety of workers in their hands. And so we have a patent pending device that would be designed for coconut automatic um, robotic automation because people just don't need to be shredding and doing all that stuff with their hands anymore because it, it, it causes it can cause injury you know so yeah can you hear me but anyway you can go to moic right now but we will be in stores soon but you know we we're identifying a manufacturing facility so that's what we're working on right now Right now we're in a shared commercial kitchen and this is why we'll be raising capital so that we can have our own manufacturing facility. Very important. We don't wanna work with a co-packer. People do not know how to make this the way we make it. We don't put sodium metabisulfite in it and we will never put bleaching chemicals in there. Um, so we have a very different process and I will not share my proprietary process and methods with co-packers. So for all the investors out there who want me to go to a co-packer, that's not happening. And we need to have a conversation about Black women in leadership leading food justice systems again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kelsey, go ahead. Thank you. So we're going to hand it over to my timer. Um, we're going to hand it over to Nate for closing remarks about what to do next. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and what a bunch of great questions. Um, so with respect to, you know, how, how you might get involved, uh, you being, you know, the audience, uh, whether you're, an, you know, investor, an entrepreneur, uh, a student, a parent, or whatnot. Uh, you know, I highlighted Sweet Farms ecosystem that's centered around education, inspiration, and innovation. And the way that uh, we view this is, every single person, regardless of your, your background or your age, uh, you can fit into minimum two of these areas. Uh, whether you're educating your friends and inspiring them to, to come try, you know, a coupe ice cream or uh, go to the vegan mob and try, you know, or the veg hub and try uh, Chef Chew's incredible product. Or, or maybe you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, also wanting to uh, inspire, uh, you know, budding scientists to join your team, or you want to educate the public by doing, uh, you know, uh, speaking engagements like this, which we really appreciate Fenguru uh, joining in and, and educating all of us about uh, these incredible uh, new technologies. Um, I think it's really about understanding uh, there are many different ways that you can get involved, and it and it doesn't even really matter your background or your uh, your your interest. There's if you're a musician, hey, pull that in. Find a way to do that. If you're a scientist, do that. If you're an elementary school student, like go go to your cafeteria lady or, or man and tell them, you know, hey, I would really like uh, more plant options. You know, there's so many ways. Uh, find your areas that you fit in. Get involved in the ecosystem. It's really exciting about what's going on. And, uh, and I personally, and I know all the other speakers, really appreciate um, this opportunity to speak uh, to you all uh, tonight. I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, India and Kelsey, who've done an incredible job uh, putting, uh, putting this event together. Uh, I know I personally appreciate it. Um, I can speak for everyone on the call uh, that you know, they do as well. Yeah, thank you so much to our speakers. We so appreciate your time and your wisdom. And thank you to all our audience members for coming. We really hope that you've enjoyed it and it's given you a lot to think about. Thank you. And thank you to Presidio Graduate School and Sweet Farm for also helping us put this on. Yes, thank, thank you. you so much. We'll stop thank the recording you. now. We'll make it available to all of you and um, you can send it to your friends too. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so everyone. much, everyone. Bye, everyone.